Hey witches, how you doing today? We're back with another video and this time I want to talk about wealth, privilege, and witchcraft. And I'm sure you're like, what the hey now? So I'm going to take you on a little story. I'm going to take you on a little ramble to how I kind of got onto this. So earlier in the year, I began setting up a study group and right, started up a study group with a couple other people and we're all kind of like middle class, you know, women, white women, to be fair. And uh, we've all kind of got disposable income. And so we kind of like, you know, we set up the study program and we're excited and we're working through it. And we just did another intake. And I noticed that w there was a, um, this time around, there was quite a uh, diversity in the applicants. And I realized not everybody ha comes from the same background that I do, or that me and the existing members of the study group do. And it kind of got me thinking, right? Um, it's a very tool heavy, um, very tool heavy tradition, which is fine. But again, right, how do you acquire those tools? Um, I had the luxury of spending $125 on just a V perfect athme. Not everybody can afford to do that. So again, I started realizing we need to take people's different um, income levels into consideration. And then I've been doing lots of reading and studying in my personal practice. And what I've noticed is this sort of wealth privilege comes up in books all the time. And I hadn't even noticed it because again, I have that privilege. So I don't even notice it. So I'm going to read you an excerpt from a book that I'm um, reading on Druidry and kind of go through a little bit, uh, a bit of an explanation about the cost of, you know, ethical, natural, handmade, and how that um, how that can be a deterrent for some people and how we need to kind of get over it. So we're going to talk about it. But before we get into it, because I'm already starting, uh, for those of you who are new around here, my name is Taya. Welcome to the channel. We talk about all things witchcraft. And for those of you who are returning viewers, maybe coming in from another video, welcome back. And thank you so much for the support. It's truly appreciated. And all of you, please consider subscribing. It's a great way to help us build the channel. All right. Let's get into it. I am going to read to you. I'm not going to give you the name of the book or the author. I am not trying to drag anyone here, um, right? This isn't about coming after an author or anything. So I'm, I'm not going to tell you the book itself, but I'm going to read to you this passage that really stood out to me, which maybe might not have stood out to me quite so much before starting the study group and having to start thinking through other people's lenses. All right. As Druidry is an earth-based tradition with a deep reverence for nature, what I would say is that it's important to ensure that your tools are as ethically sourced as possible. We must be aware of stones and crystals that are blasted from mountainsides, animals that may have suffered, or items produced in sweatshop factories. If you intend to do a peaceful ritual, for example, with a drinking horn from a cow who suffered from intensive farming, wearing robes made by a 12-year-old girl in India working 16-hour days, then it is more than likely that the ritual will be entirely superficial. We must sacrifice any ignorance about what we use each and every day, as well as in ritual, in order to truly follow a religion or spirituality that has reverence for nature at its very heart. So, she has basically said, it is likely that the ritual will be entirely superficial, i.e. your magic ain't gonna work if you're not ethical, natural, handmade, blah, blah, blah. And in order to truly follow a religion or spirituality that has reverence for nature at its core, we must sacrifice any ignorance about what we use each and every day. So again, if you want to do this right, if you want to be a real practitioner, it sounds pretty privileged to me. Let's break it down. All right, so crystals need to be ethically sourced in mind. Leather horn animal products, no suffering, so like natural lives, as natural as possible. No sweatshop items. And she doesn't get into it so much in this passage, but it does come up later in the book about wearing all natural fibers. Okay, so 
the common thread with all these things is that they come with a price tag. Ethically sourced crystals. All right, did some research. Went to Happy Crystal Co. It's a Canadian online crystal, ethically, all ethically sourced, good stuff. So for a rose quartz tumble, about this size, $2. Okay. At my local witch store where, yeah, we don't really know where they're necessarily sourced from, 50 cents. Okay. It's a 400% markup, but you're like, eh, 50 cents, $2. Is that big of a deal? Ethical animal products. So again, later in the book, she talks about drums and how she ethically sourced the leather for her drum that she handmade. So we actually very recently had a local store do a really cool workshop on making your own ritual drum. They had like an, in, I believe he was an indigenous practitioner, came in, brought in all of these like materials. I'm assuming they were like ethically sourced. I don't know for sure, right? And you could handcraft your very own and then it had different prices for different, for different size drums. So the smallest was a 14 inch drum at $275. And I mean, all the products, all of the, all of the, um, the, the ingredients, so to speak, were provided right? Plus the instruction on how to put this together for yourself. And you would build it during this workshop. So pretty cool. 275 bucks. On Amazon, you can purchase a 14 inch drum for like 89 bucks. So again, going with the handmade of the glee source, that's a 300% price markup. Handmade robes, 100% cotton, right? Must be because I mean, wool robes or silk robes, those are gonna be even more expensive. So 100% cotton, handmade robes. This is from me when I did in my own practice. I found them handmade on Etsy, $107. And I'm gonna be honest, it took me a lot of research to find that, okay? $107, handmade to my, to my like height and everything. On Amazon, for $25.89, you can buy white polyester robes. That's there for a 400% markup to purchase the handmade cotton robes. And I'm going to be honest, that 100% cotton could have still been made in a sweatshop in, in, in India or China or whatever, right? I don't even know where that fabric came from. So again, so for all of these things that are more ethical, natural, or handmade, it's a three to 400% markup just based on my short little bit of research. That is a lot. That you are paying three to four times more for something that is ethical, natural, or handmade. Now, most of us, I find, a lot of us anyways, don't even notice. They don't pick up on that discrepancy, right? We don't even really pick up or understand that what's being advocated for is coming from a place of wealth privilege. We just accept that that's the cost of, of a proper practice, of a real practice. That's just what it costs. That's what you gotta do. And I can understand the concept of why ethical, natural, handmade is better. And I think if you can do better, if you can afford better, yeah, you should pay that price. But does that mean, therefore, that the alternative is worse or I'll be wrong. All right, let's take a look. Polyester robes. Is that polyester somehow blocking your access to nature? Can the like messages from spirit not permeate the polyester? No. Your drum bought off Amazon. Do the spirits have a harder time hearing it? No. How about that 50 cent quartz piece? Is it less powerful? Not really. Show it some love, do a little bit of cleansing, and it's probably just as, just as effective as the $2 one. So while we glorify ethical, natural, handmade items, we have to remember that their counterparts do not diminish the practices of somebody else, right? Let's look at through another lens. What would the ancestors do? Your neighbor, now they didn't have like factory farming and shit like that back then, right? Fair enough. But what if your neighbor had like a, they abused their animals and they beat them and they starved them. And then that animal 
passed away and they were selling, I don't know, the horns to make drinking cups at like a steal of a deal. Pretty sure they would have taken them and processed them. Right? What if they had access to cheap polyester? Right? I don't know. Somebody from the future came back in time and was like, hey, check out this really cheap fabric. They'd have used it. Right? It was a time of utilitarian means. Right? It was what could you get your hands on? Everybody was struggling. Right? We're talking about our, our like peasant ancestors, not our, you know, I used to be Cleopatra in another lifetime, but like your actual, you know, majority of your ancestors who were just scraping by day to day, they would take what they could get. Now, in today's times, we have issues that they didn't have back then. And if you can do better, then yes, do better. But don't look down on others who can't, right? Don't say that, you know, what did she say in, in, in there about like your ritual is not going to be as effective. In fact, it's just going to be superficial. Or saying, right, that if you want to have a true, to be a true follower of something. I, I don't think that's the rhetoric that we're going for here, right? We want to go for inclusivity, not exclusivity, right? Think about it, all of our healthy eating, ethically sourcing, supporting local and handmade, those inherently come with a price tag, right? Even look at like healthy eating stuff, right? They look at um, BIPOC communities who live in these massive rundown suburbs, have no grocery stores near them, but they can go to McDonald's and get a 99 cent meal for their kids. That's what they're gonna do because that's what they can afford. They can't afford the transportation to and from the grocery store to pick up three ninety nine mangoes, right? They're like, eh, 99 cents. It's McDonald's. It's right there. That's what I'm going to go to. That's where the health epidemic comes from. Anyways, I digress. Um, I guess the point is to recognize your position of privilege, right? If you can support those initiatives, that's great. And I, I, I honestly think if you can afford to do it, you should be doing it. But it does not make you better or more effective or morally superior to those who cannot afford ethical, natural, or handmade. If someone can afford it and chooses to forego it, have at it. Your girlfriend who's sitting in the burbs and practicing witchcraft with you and she's cheaping out and buying everything cheap on Amazon, right? Have a word with her and be like, my girl, I know you can afford to do better. But don't, but that being said, you don't necessarily know her entire financial situation and it's not your place to judge. You could come from a place of love and say, hey, these are choices I'm making. Would you like to make them with me? Um, but we don't always know other people's situations and especially when it's strangers or other people that we're just meeting, you know, in a group or at a public ritual and we're like... She's wearing polyester robes and she has an Amazon drum. Oh my God. Right? We need to leave that at, at the door, right? And I guess when it comes to these books that are advocating this sort of message, again, take it with a huge grain of salt. Right? If And if you're reading these books and you can't afford a handmade cotton robe, buy the $20 Amazon polyester robe. Right? It doesn't make your practice any less, right? And if you can afford it, just remember your privilege and zip it. So you tell me guys, do you agree with that? Have you encountered this wealth privilege before in your practice? Um, I'll be honest, I didn't think I, you know, it didn't even really occur to me until I started sort of working a lot more in groups with other people and having to take other considerations into view. And I went, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize I had this sort of wealth privilege. Do you have wealth privilege? Do you not? How has that made you feel not having that wealth privilege to be able to be all ethical, natural and handmade, right? Have people made you feel less in your practice? I, I mean, I really hope not. I really, truly hope that we as a community are more welcoming than that, than what the, the book I'm reading makes it sound like. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'd love to know your experiences. Leave us a comment. Otherwise, that is our video for today. Thank you so much for hanging out. Um, I hope you learned something. I hope you got something from that. And otherwise, yeah, we'll catch you in the next video.
Thanks so much, you guys.